I'm so glad that you could join us today. And I do appreciate the fact that uh, we have just a few minutes before the official uh, noon time. Uh, I do want to make sure that you are clear the webinar will be recorded and that if you have questions or observations at any time, please feel free to post those in the chat room. And uh, I very much uh, would appreciate that. And I will address those observations or comments uh, at various times uh, during the webinar. And I very much uh, thank you for joining uh, this series. This today is a, we kick off uh, the webinar series, as you probably saw on our events page. Uh, where I'm going to be doing a webinar once a month on topics uh, that I hope are quite relevant to the work that you're doing. And certainly uh, they're there because they uh, hit very robustly on the kinds of issues I find uh, that those of us who are working to, to enrich the talent uh, in organizations and enterprises is very much on the list. So. I would say uh, you should feel free at any time to send us a note to you either um, through the website or, or if you have, and I believe you do have Garrick's email address, uh, just a particular topic that you feel um, is uh, very important and something that you would like uh, to have um, reviewed and covered. Um, I'm more than happy to take a look at those topics and. Uh, utilize and integrate those topics as necessary. So please, um, again, for those of you who've just joined, please be sure and use the chat space for comments and observations as we work through the material uh, that I'm going to be sharing with you today, which as you know, um, our topic is um, why um, soft skills really are the hardest. Um, most of you uh, know, but I'm, I'm going to uh, do a little bio just in case. It's not one of those things that's on <laughs> uh, your particular um, awareness. Uh, I have for the last um, oh, number of years been working with Bob Eichinger to um, both integrate our knowledge and our research efforts over the many years of our uh, mutual careers into a way of thinking and approaching talent management and uh, the development of others, which I hope is eminently practical and um, uh, the kinds of material that people will find uh, useful. <clears throat> As you can see, I have a particular uh, list of questions or items that I'm going to cover in this webinar. And once again, feel free at any time to uh, drop notes in the uh, chat box, uh, questions or reactions, and I'm happy to respond to those as uh, time will allow. As you know, all of us who are in this field um, have in some ways <laughs> Uh, we all suffer from the curse of expertise. And one of the elements of that curse is that we develop a blindness to issues and topics over time and carry around a whole host of unchallenged assumptions. And uh, I'm raising my hand to say guilty. Uh, and to try to uh, circumvent that as best I can, uh, I, I have been approaching all of the topics not only in this webinar series, but in the work that Bob and I have been doing now for nearly a decade, uh, with, uh, if you will, a variety of questions, which I think are um, categorized, as you see on the screen, um, in ways that help me be systematic when I approach a particular topic. You'll see that as we come through this topic and the other topics, there are going to be uh, data sources, I'm simply going to alert you to where the various uh, key uh, themes 
have emerged in terms of the data that's been collected from multiple sources. Um, I'm particularly in, uh, interested in the kinds of analysis that researchers have done and the kinds of analysis that um, we've done in our own database to look at what are some of the interrelated dynamics that could be uh, at work. And then, of course, the very pragmatic question, uh, what are the consequences of acting on the things we found uh, and what are the kinds of things we need to do if in fact we're going to uh, be successful. And since I, I love a good question, <clears throat> I thought I would simply share with you some of the interesting resources that um, I've looked at and reviewed over the last couple of years. Uh, folks have been writing about the power of questions and I have been intrigued uh, by some neuroscientists who have discovered that the nature of the question and the quality of the question uh, opens, can open up perceptions or narrow them, uh, can invite um, a reconsideration of a circumstance or an issue, or in fact, um, very limit the way a person thinks about and reacts to an issue. And I just happen to think that uh, asking a good question um, and pursuing questions in the work that we do, whether it's coaching, or a program design or facilitation um, is very important in how we um, achieve the kinds of things we want to achieve in the work that we're doing. Now, today, soft skills are the hardest, uh, sent me into a whole host of uh, resources. I was especially curious to find um, how soft skills were being um, explored recently within such areas as neuroscience and the journal, of course, Emotions, Journal of Emotions, which has a fascinating, um, pretty regular exploration of how these things we refer to as soft skills and our emotional makeup are interrelated. Uh, you can find white papers on this topic from places like the Center for Creative Leadership or Deloitte or McKinsey. The Carnegie Mellon Foundation has recently published some materials on the soft skills and the Graduate Management Council, Council has similarly been looking at the role of soft skills and the success of uh, students after their graduate school work. I found that uh, when you start talking about an issue like soft skills, the natural question is, well, what is the contrasting uh, set of skills that we refer to as hard skills? And no surprise that if you go look up multiple definitions of hard skills, uh, they're typically described as the kinds of skills required to competently do a job often the expertise such as programming expertise or accounting expertise or logistics expertise, any of those kinds of things are considered um, necessary for the person to competently do the job. These are skills that are often seen as quite measurable that we can actually determine that a person has utilized the skills or not. And more often than not, these are skills that have been acquired through uh, formal education, various training programs, uh, certification programs, and of course, on the job kinds of experiences. And then of course, when you ask the question, how many people fail by virtue of a failure of hard skills? And some say as few as 5% of the workforce fail because of the, the inability or the failure to execute hard skills. Most uh, hit at around 20%, which means 80% of what is going on when a person is not successful in a role uh, is unrelated to hard skills, which is partially why the topic is so spectacularly important to us who are in this arena. Recently, I had the opportunity to work with a um, 
company in Greensboro, North Carolina, and in working with them on their strategic plan, and of course, the question of the linkage between their business plan and their talent is a very important one, a very big one. Um, and in talking with them, I um, made note that they had some uh, very clear statements about uh, what they consider benchmark behaviors of servant leadership. And in the conversations, I said, I'm, I'm curious uh, when people are not successful here, um, what's usually the reason for the failure or the reason to ask a person to leave the company and go work somewhere else. And um, overwhelmingly, both the executives and the senior middle management teams said, well, uh, we rarely, if it's been a long time since someone um, who was hired lacked in critical or technical skills that was evident as they started doing their work. Um, usually, uh, each year when people are let go, it's because they don't live up to the servant leadership standards. And the CEO was very quick to say, <clears throat> we have monitored this and we know that when individuals are not perceived as respectful of others, not perceived as personally collaborative with others, that it costs us lots of money and it's easier, easier and better for us to move those people along um, than to try to fix them. Um, and that's their perspective and their attitude. And I thought, wow, that's very interesting. I think almost all companies these days have some statement about being respectful of differences or making sure that people get um, the kind of support or being supportive of one another. There are a whole host of what we might think of interpersonal skills that rarely um, carry the same weight as, as, as in this particular example and illustration. Recently, in one report, the folks who, who are looking at big picture uh, issues and skills and training reported that it is their estimation that there will be a massive financial loss uh, this year by virtue of uh, what's referred to as the deficit, um, the soft skills deficit. And then when you, when you start digging into these analytical pieces, typically the costs have to do with how much money they've spent to acquire talent. And then, of course, the talent leaves because they don't feel respected or regarded or um, that they are not a good fit for the culture. And there's the retraining costs of those talent that's left. Um, the calculation of the loss of discretionary effort among employees who feel they're working with um, either colleagues or <clears throat> bosses who are not particularly um, uh, oriented toward giving uh, recognition and support for individuals. We've seen that uh, those who study accidents at work <clears throat> report that 95% of the accidents at work have nothing to do with failure of machinery or the failure of um, a policy, but, but having to do with uh, employees who were distracted because of an emotional reaction to something, either that they brought to work or that was created by virtue of what a boss said to them, um, there are just really quite heartbreaking stories of employees working in manufacturing related operations with big machines who get uh, engaged in an interaction with the boss you know, that goes awry and the employee returns to the machine angry and frustrated and um, sabotages the machine and or uh, gets careless and a mistake occurs and there's a serious injury. And of course, we know that the gossip uh, time spent at work increases as, as negative 
um, arousal occurs that people who feel that they uh, aren't in a safe space or who feel that they're not particularly respected for what they bring to the table um, often um, spend more time on unrelated work activities which produce part of the loss that we have just referred to. I think it's interesting when you start looking at different sources of how do you define soft skills and how do you identify how important those soft skills are. You see that in these two examples, these are two different um, sources of folks who said, well, gosh, let's find out when people are looking on the web uh, and looking for what we might think of as soft skills, either information or YouTube webinar um, uh, videos or other kinds of additional data on various topics, what's at the top of the list and what's at the bottom. And as you can see in this particular study, which is, was a social network study, um, working in teams, communication, leadership, uh, friendly, interpersonal, taking initiative, creativity, adaptability, all of those kinds of uh, issues we can report as certainly what's considered soft skill oriented and pretty much uh, quite high on the list, especially working in teams. And we have a lot we could say about that and perhaps we'll get a chance to in just a minute. If you will, um, you'll see on the right side of the screen from another study, they took a look at what are the soft skills that really matter and they reorganized them into very different groups. Uh, decision making, for example, fell in the leadership category along with delegation, mentoring, et cetera. In the teamwork, we see things like collaboration and, and the way in which we network and communicate and build and, and are flexible within teams. Um, it's very interesting to me to see problem solving emerging increasingly as um, a, a kind of um, uh, soft skill area, which is fascinating. And of course, in the communication arena, now, um, in these two particular efforts to aggregate information, you'll notice that there's some things which we might say, well, gosh, where's empathy or interpersonal savvy or, um, well, a number of those kinds of what we consider soft skills, con being congruent and authentic and things of that nature. And in other studies, no doubt, those, those sorts of things come up, those topics come up. Uh, it's just that in these particular studies, um, those uh, themes didn't particularly emerge, that we could argue that we know um, empathetic regard is a very powerful skill um, for executives and leaders and peers, really, um, at any level in an organization to uh, exhibit with one another. <clears throat> On, I made an effort to pull together, I just shared with you two studies, but there were multiple studies. And um, what are the things that kept coming up or the things that people kept saying? Well, these are the most important people skills. Um, the EQ uh, oriented P, uh, 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 soft skills. And we could pause here and take a trip down the EQ arena conversation and um, have ourselves quite a time in teasing out what do we mean by EQ. Um, there are uh, very definitive opinions about emotional intelligence from neuroscientists, very different opinions from personality researchers, again, extremely different opinions um, about the nature of EQ from researchers like Mayer, Salovey, and Caruso. Um, and it's not to say that any of them are wrong, it's just that um, 
in my view, we're still in a pioneer condition around emotional intelligence. We, we know that emotions are vital, being able to determine the information in emotions in yourself and in others, and to skillfully use that emotional energy in productive ways um, is a true uh, discriminator between the, the sort of typical manager and the exceptional manager. Um, recently, in taking a group of managers through um, a listening skills uh, program, uh, one, one of the managers uh, made the statement that he didn't realize that listening was such hard work. And um, he said, you know, if I have to work this hard to listen to people, I'll be breaking out in sweats all the time. Uh, and it, it was a eye-opening experience for him in the listening exercises that we did, that listening is as um, difficult and as demanding um, as it is as a skill. Um, likewise, when we get into looking at persuasion and influence, we all agree uh, those are particularly important skills when you're trying to uh, convince people to do things and or influence decisions, uh, all of which require that you manage a whole host of dynamics within the interaction, et cetera. No, no surprise to any of us that these would keep coming up as really important um, soft skills. And of course, when you ask folks like, well, why, why do you think we think of these as soft skills. And typically uh, the answer is, well, they're pretty hard to measure. How do we really know that a communication skill has improved? Um, how do we know that there's a competent enrichment of some sort that's going on when a person is supposedly working on, let's say, self-management skills? Are there objective measures? And if there are, would those measures really matter? Because all of these skills, um, the success of them is really determined by other people's perceptions. So it's, a, it's an interesting conversation when you start looking at, um, well, these are soft in part because we can't really measure them quite the same way. Um, we can only look at episodic events, and if we see that a person uh, before a communication and listening skills workshop, uh, in fact, <clears throat> cuts people off and interrupts people and is pretty much a bully interpersonally, and then after a workshop, we notice that they seem to exhibit more self-control. We don't see the interrupting. Uh, we don't see the uh, sort of hyper reactivity that sometimes occurs. We would say, wow, that person seems to have gained insight and is making an effort to change. Um, but we haven't really measured it in quite the same way as we might measure an engineering skill or an accounting skill, for example. And how much improvement is enough? Um, how much do we expect a person uh, to in, improve on these particular kinds of skills in the work that they do? Well, as I, I attempt to do always when I'm looking at a topic, I'm, I'm very curious about any evidence that it matters. Um, do we have evidence that soft skills really do make a difference in terms of financial outcomes, whether or not retention is, a, is in fact measured productively, as well as um, how discretionary engagement occurs? And there are certainly multiple studies that show um, how powerful uh, improvement in soft skills can be. It, it wasn't too long ago a confidential study was executed by McKinsey and company um, amongst insurance providers. And what the insurance providers wanted to know is what, what was really going on as to why some insurance providers were consistently um, low in their loss ratios, which is a good thing, 
if you think about it, for every dollar of an insurance premium, if you're gonna lose 70 cents of that dollar because of a claim and or expenses, then you're, in essence, your quote, so-called profit is only 30 cents on the dollar. Um, if you're over a dollar, meaning your loss ratio is 100% or 110 or 120%, you're in serious trouble because if that trend continues, it won't be long before you're out of money and you can't really uh, support the operation. Well, the fascinating thing was when the researchers got through, they said, wow, the one major difference between those whose loss ratios were below 70 cents on the dollar and those that were higher than uh, 100% of the dollar uh, was what was referred to as frontline interaction skills. And by that they meant um, how people interact with each other inside the organization as well as um, how individuals um, uh, interacted with the customers. And so th there again, there are studies that do exist that consistently show um, that when we elevate this skill level, uh, amongst those who are working in organizations, and we might well say uh, even uh, the individuals that we are focused on to enhance their overall effectiveness, um, attending to these uh, soft areas in one's work life um, makes a big difference. And in spite of the overwhelming evidence, it gets published uh, regularly in big newspapers like the New York Times or journals like the Harvard Business Review. It's often one of the first things on the um, docket to cut when there are uh, issues of, of monies available for training. And it's one of those things that even though organizations say and have evidence within their own operations um, that this matters. It matters as a long-term investment. It matters for over, over time, the development of talent. Um, unfortunately, they uh, will limit or remove the support for what we might refer to as the soft skills training. Um, in other studies, there are often some what I consider gross generalizations, meaning they, they look at big patterns and trends. One study two years ago published in the New York Times uh, indicated that public traded companies who have investments in leadership development activities um, have a stronger stock portfolio than those who do not. Well, that's a really big sweep. And until you get into the details, sometimes hard to really ascertain um, what's, what's the evidence. We know that um, every time there are reports about um, employees and they're leaving companies or going from one place to the other or changing in their investment in the organization they're in, and I don't mean investment in terms of dollars, I mean in terms of time and energy, um, that there just is a persistent stream of evidence that the inattention to um, these kinds of behaviors carry with it a high price. And not only do we see a decrease in effort, but we also know that when people shift and change in positions, um, that in fact, um, uh, it, it, the attention to soft skills is even greater when you're going from an individual contributor to a manager or a manager into an executive role. Um, the attention to the subtleties and the richness of soft skills um, becomes uh, especially uh, worth paying attention to. Well, it's a worthwhile question when we talk about training and development in this environment, the world we're in today. Um, what are some of the things we mean? And, and most of the time, but not always, when people talk about soft skills development, they really are talking about um, what we've referred to today as horizontal skills, meaning um, they're adding 
uh, a skill to their checklist. They're learning how, for example, to give feedback. They're learning how to be an active listener. And they're adding those behaviors. And primarily, we, we are doing that. We're enriching those skills for people by getting them to practice in a variety of ways and providing feedback. Practice can come not only in particular assignments, but also um, in the kinds of things we design in experiential learning um, in a, a classroom-related setting. Vertical development, on the other hand, it, many folks would say, you, you know, this means that as the person moves up in complexity around a skill, it really is about changing perspective. It's about expanding one's sort of metacognitive understanding of uh, why a soft skill will, will really matter. So if you think about it, if you teach a person to paraphrase and, and really help them understand that paraphrasing is a way of a feedback loop to confirm that communication has occurred, um, that's a horizontal skill. But an individual who learns that listening has deep layers to it and that paraphrasing is simply one particular behavior that's connected to a much larger variable and that you want to do this because it enhances your overall being, if you will. It's not just a skill being added, but it's, it's really going to enrich your personal why. Um, then in fact, we are, we, are, we are about a significant mind shift. And it, it seems that through coaching and you know, uh, mentoring, uh, getting people to reflect on what they really want to achieve and what they want to get out of their work um, is reasons for a person deciding that they, they really do want to shift perspective and take and have a, a big picture. Well, there are reasons why soft skills are so hard. Um, as I've already said, they're hard to measure. Uh, setting benchmarks for progress is, is difficult often. Um, there's no one and done learning experience. Uh, it requires, all of these skills require ongoing insight and feedback. We, we don't you know, engage in one business simulation and suddenly realize the power of collaboration. Um, the power of collaboration seems to evaporate as the intensity for meeting certain production numbers increases. Um, so it's, it's not a one and done thing. Uh, we, we know that on many work skills, uh, such as skills on the job, um, after a trial or two, the person gets it, they can do it and do it with efficiency, but not so when it comes to our soft skills category. We also know that soft skills vary in difficulty and complexity. Um, let's just consider when we talk about being politically savvy, how complicated um, that can be and uh, how um, challenging it can be to be reading and understanding, reading the body language and understanding the subtleties of language that are involved in politically sensitive situations. It's, I, I have to say, uh, one of the reasons why it's difficult is that for many people, soft skills are not inherently satisfying. They do not sense or uh, in any way find that there's a rewarding outcome for engaging in the quality of listening or engaging in the quality of attention that we believe uh, enables a leader or a manager or a peer to work more successfully with uh, another individual. Um, it's, it's a hard pill to swallow when you've dedicated your, your life to helping people learn and grow to, to realize that, um, gosh, uh, a person may choose to learn a listening skill simply because it's required 
not because it, it brings any particular personal satisfaction or sense of reward or accomplishment. Though externally, those of us who, who would argue, well, gosh, every time you get to be a better listener, it, it's, in, it's an improvement for everybody. But that's an assumption. That is something that we, we believe there's evidence for. Um, but for the individual who's learned that skill, it doesn't necessarily mean they inherently see the value of it. And that is, that's really um, one of those things that when you think about it, uh, those who take it for granted that enhancing empathy is a richly rewarding experience, um, we can discover that for many people, empathy has no satisfaction whatsoever. Uh, it is simply something they realize they need to show some effort at empathetic response in order to get the cooperation that they might want to get out of other people. The other uh, element that makes soft skills hard is the, the real um, personal sense that if I make an improvement, if I go through all the hard work of learning a new skill or deepening a skill, um, if, if I do all that, it, <laughs> it may not matter to other people's perceptions um, that in fact, it's only when I do things consistently enough over time that people perceive there's been an improvement or an enrichment that um, it, it seems to matter that I've taken on that skill and I've engaged um, uh, in this, this activity to be better um, at what I do. Another big reason, and perhaps the most complicated reason, has to do with our, our brain and how our brain operates. And there have been a number of studies in the Journal of uh, Behavioral Neuroscience and other neuroscience uh, labs and researchers where they try to look at what are the kinds of things that create changes on the cortex in terms of cortical activity, uh, measuring energy use and consumption. And what I think is a ubiquitous conclusion is that um, the brain is very stingy. It has only so much energy that it wants to deploy. And it's trying to save up energy for critical circumstances. And as a result, it defaults to known pathways, which is what helps us, um, if you will, get through the day. The automaticity of behavior uh, requires a minimal consumption of energy. And when you're learning something that seems new and vague, um, something that doesn't have a measurable benchmark, something that is contingent upon the contextual setting. There's lots of energy that's being consumed and the brain's not particularly happy about it. Um, the brain isn't particularly intrigued with um, this activity you're engaged in, let's say, to be a deep listener, learning deep listening skills. And the, the reason is that every neuron in our body has a program that says we want to find comfort, avoid pain, and do it efficiently. Our system is uh, designed to find the comfort zone, <laughs> to avoid the discomfort zone, and to do that in the most efficient and effective, effective way possible. Uh, changing behavior the brain often finds as unpleasant because of the amount of energy it takes and the discomfort it creates and creates um, in that discomfort. It triggers a whole host of sub programs that, that tell the brain alert, alert, alert. You're using energy you might need for some more threatening circumstance. Our, our brain has our own little lost in space robot. Uh, danger, Will Robinson, danger. Um, you're using energy you might need uh, in some more critical, serious circumstance. And of course, 
all of this is going on um, without any of our individual permission. It's in the coding and the way things operate. As one neuroscientist pointed out that, you know, the neurons that fire together, wire together, and that wiring together um, helps create the efficiency and create the um, energy distribution that I just referred to uh, related to how our, our brain likes to operate. I'm willing to bet you in your work with individuals, um, they have said, when they looked, for example, at a 360, um, that said something like, you know, fantastic planner, lousy listener. Fantastic in achieving financial goals, lousy at collaborating with teams. Um, and they look at that data and they'll go, well, this really isn't news. I've heard this before. Um, but it's just not particularly rewarded. It's not, you know, being collaborative is kind of nice and, and cushiony when you can, but what I get rewarded for is meeting the number of projections. Um, uh, most of the time in conversations, uh, we'll hear, you know, what's in it for me? Why, why is collaboration really going to be a benefit for me? I haven't seen that it's been all that useful in the past when I've made efforts to do that. Um, will it truly make a difference? Uh, and you know, it's it, every time I, I, I pick up a, a journal or read an article which has something like the following data, I, I just chuckle because we, we know <laughs> how important these soft skills are and bridging between knowing and doing seems to be a formidable uh, challenge. Uh, in one recent study, when asked, uh, several thousand managers were said with confidence that, um, gee, 80% of them said they would give regular respectful feedback to help the enterprise be successful. And when employees were asked, um, how often did you feel you received respectful feedback to help you be successful in your role, only about 5%. So if 80% of the managers feel they're doing it and only 5% of the employees are experiencing it, um, we really do have a significant gap in perception and experience. Some of you might remember uh, back in around 2006, a Harvard Business Review published an article that uh, I believe was titled something like The Cost of Difficult People. And uh, the story goes that the researchers of this article, when they had collected all of their data uh, and put together the piece, they, they wrote the editor of the Harvard Business Review and said, you know, um, overwhelmingly, there is a word that people used that I don't believe has ever been published in your magazine. And if you want us to, we'll, we will modify and imply. Um, but in fact, the word has come up a vast number of times when asked to describe um, difficult people. And uh, the word was asshole. And when they published the article with the word in it, the month afterwards, there were thousands of emails that came in that said, let me tell you about the asshole in my organization. And those emails given to the researchers eventually became the business book, The No Asshole Rule. And that book was very popular for a while um, and one that got people's attention about, well, gee, how, when you get designated as that kind of person, what did you do? What the researchers concluded was that uh, you're dealing with this difficult person when you leave an interaction where you feel diminished. Now, as I think about that, I think about the complexity of interactions where you may be uh, driven by trying to be time efficient, you may be driven by trying to be specific and clear, um, and you engage in an interaction 
and you walk away from that feeling as though I've been efficient, I've communicated the information clearly, but the person experienced that they were not heard, not understood, um, and had just been given new marching orders. There was no intention to diminish, and yet that's how and what people experienced. And of course, under that definition, we would all have to raise our hand and say, gosh, there have been times when I've probably been a difficult person. But in fact, this is at the heart of the nature of soft skills. How do we communicate and engage and involve ourselves with other people in a way that they leave feeling inspired and motivated um, and uh, eager to be a part of what it is we're trying to do? Well, this knowing doing gap is not new. In fact, Kurt Lewin had what I consider to be one of the most uh, interesting formulas for understanding what does it take for a person, uh, given all the brain material I just shared, given all the variables that we know play into what makes it hard, what are the, the, what's the formula, the hidden formula that says we have to pay attention to these things if there is going to be a shift, if we are going to know from, no, go from knowing interpersonal savvy, interpersonal respect, um, communicating with regard, all those kinds of things are important. And what Lewin said was, you first have to have some sense of discomfort. You, sat, you have to decide, well, I, I get it that people want from me, uh, they perceive if, that I need in, and I can be more effective if I am more respectful. And that translates into particular behaviors like my body language, the tone I use, um, the way in which I interact. Um, that that I have to I have to decide at some level internally that this discomfort is worth paying attention to. Then I have to have a vision for what it looks how it looks differently. If I've gotten feedback that I'm not a particularly effective listener, for example, and I I thought about it and I go, okay, I, when I'm engaged with people, I'm more I'm spending more headspace in. What am I going to say? How am I going to critique? What am I going to question? How am I going to push back? As opposed to listening to the person. Um, if I want to change that, I have to have an idea of what it looks when it's different, when it's better. I have to have a vision. And that has to be added with a knowledge of first steps. So some of you who, who've used, um, for example, the People Skills Handbook, you know that the action tips were designed to give knowledge of first steps. You know that the description of the skills were designed to provide a vision when a person uh, needed more uh, information. The same is true when we have um, invested in the way we've created the uh, Develop It Yourself guides, which I'll talk about in a minute which say, gosh, you know, if you were not, uh, if you're wanting to enhance a skill, tune up a skill, here's a vision for how it looks, and here are first steps to do to get there. But Lewin very smartly said, all of that is multiplied by a belief in self. And even if you're uncomfortable, you have a vision, you know what to do, but you don't particularly believe that it's worth the effort or believe that you have it within you to do it, um, then it will not overcome the current financial or psychological comforts that you uh, enjoy. So Lewin pointed out that when belief in self, which multiplied by the additive elements to the left, is greater, that the sense that I will achieve better success or greater psychological comfort, then I'm more likely to make that change and, and make the effort to, to make that change and make a difference. And 
I, I think Lewin's observation is, is, seems to me to be um, pretty accurate, that when we um, enable an individual to get clearer about what this feedback is that shows the gap between what they know and what they do and how it can be different and how they can move forward in small ways um, and boost their confidence of doing it, there's a greater chance that change will occur. Well, I mentioned our approach, and one of the things I, I want to make sure you know is that when we um, started our work now a number of years ago, we, we realized that we needed to think about organizations perhaps in some fresh and hopefully uh, new and productive ways. And as we sort of from scratch said, okay, organizations take in a space where they have boundaries, those boundaries are maintained through the culture of the organization, its mission and direction, and things organize around those, those pieces to have an organization thrive and to move forward. And within that organizational space, there are worlds that are operating that serve very particular things. Individual contributors are busily producing the services and or products that are going to customers. Managers and supervisors are translating the vision. They're supervising the energies and the distribution of resources and the management of vendors within this equation so that in fact things are efficiently and effectively being done. And that in fact, um, uh, the leaders at the top of the organization are dealing with multiple stakeholders that are impinging upon the organization, just like the vendors and the customers are. And that this set of dynamic relationships produces several interesting phenomena. So, we, we determined as we did our work that there were various roles in each of these worlds that individuals needed to be successful in and that to achieve the roles, there were varieties of practices that individuals needed to engage in and needed to do um, in order to uh, uh, be effective in the space that they're in. So when I started looking at our, the evidence we've been collecting in each of these worlds, what are, for example, the kinds of soft skills that are seen as critical and often rated as less effective or less used or less utilized within each of these worlds? And so here, here you see just eight of um, the overall 27 practices within the individual contributors world that we found. And we know um, that they're very specific things around each of these soft skills that matter and very specific things that individuals can learn uh, to be uh, more effective at uh, demonstrating these practices to be successful uh, in their role as individual contributors. The same thing around managers or supervisors. We I uh, took a look at what are the things that people are telling us are absolutely mission critical, um, often rated lower though in effectiveness and or demonstration. And this would be eight of 30 practices that we know uh, keep showing up as being vital for a manager or a supervisor to be successful uh, within the role in the world that they operate in, in the organization. And of course, uh, at the highest level of the organization, again, um, there are things that people have said, gosh, these are vital for a leader to be successful and often um, not as effective um, in that world as uh, we might wish to see. So, in our new approach in dealing especially with the soft skill arenas, but in the whole, given the whole story really, um, we've said, you know, these worlds carry with them different psychological burdens and different psychological expectations and that cutting across them all 
uh, are the notion that you have teams and that puts in a whole new layer of soft skills. And then of course, there are high potentials running around within these worlds who need to be identified and nurtured in very, very different ways, um, which we've certainly attempted to do in the material that we've created really to help um, manifest Lewin's proposition uh, in the material about being clear about what it is you could do that's different, how you could get there one small step at a time, written in a spirit of, of support uh, to boost belief in self in order for people to get to where we need them to be. We, we try to help organizations, and perhaps you do too, um, by helping folks get alignment with what's important here. Not every single soft skill is necessarily vital in a particular environment. Um, we have to create a profile of what that looks like. And of course, our sort card sorts enable us to help organizations do that. Uh, we also use it with individuals and individual coaching. Uh, using the card sort as a prompter for Let's, getting, let's get clear, where do you really need to spend your energy uh, to get maximum benefit in your developmental focus this particular year, or this particular uh, period of time? How can we analyze and appropriately look at the perceived uh, gap? And certainly 360s is a great way to do that. And since soft skills, the success of those um, really are driven by how people perceive you're doing in those. And of course, there's the whole prioritization of what's going to contribute to the short and long-term effectiveness of individuals and or people in various roles inside of an organization. And then, of course, the development of the plan that makes sense for them, because we know, given the amount of energy that's required to enrich uh, what we have labeled the soft skills. We know that energy is going to be um, achieved through some stretching, which is gonna require feedback and coaching and uh, an ongoing, if you will, conversation um, with the individual to help them achieve whatever that stretch needs to be. And of course, monitoring and ongoing adjusting um, is, as we all know, uh, vital for a person to make the kind of shift um, that we need them to make. And in our Develop It Yourself guides, um, we provide all kinds of background around each of the practices and soft skills and um, the kinds of things to be aware of uh, that you'll want to act on uh, to make um, the most of that training. Now, I wanted to make sure and leave some time for questions, and I want to take a moment and look at uh, a number of the things that have been posted in the chat space for me. Um, uh, some of you noted uh, that you are using the People Skills Handbook. I'm delighted to hear that and hope that you uh, have found that to be helpful. And indeed, several of you have said so. Um, a number of you have indicated you were surprised that empathy didn't show up on the list I showed earlier, but as I pointed out, it just so happened those were some of the studies that I uh, just showed you to illustrate the point. Uh, interesting comment that <laughs> Uh, just for the fun of it, you know, the Old Testament is hard and the New Testament is soft <laughs> in approach. And uh, let's see here. Another person has noted the effectiveness of soft skills is in the eyes of the recipient. And then there could be strong correlations between MBTI preferences or temperaments. Um, for example, NTs may not appreciate NF's approach um, and, and may not appreciate SF's approaches uh, as other NF's or SF's may appreciate. And of course, um, that's interesting because you, you raise a very, very different kind of question 
we could take it out of a type conversation and say the personality differences themselves which impact the meaning making that individuals go through uh, would in fact impact the way in the way in which people are perceived and the difficulty they may be perceived as uh, generating or creating um, in the everyday work life uh, as well as personal lives with others. Interesting. I any other questions or observations? I'm just about to run out of time. Uh, I do uh, appreciate your participation and would love it if you would uh, uh, let me know what other kinds of questions or follow-up questions you have. We'll be sending out a summary of today's webinar there are various key points that i would like for you to have and to keep posted close by so that you can be reminded of just how important the work is that you're doing uh, in your helping in the way in which you coach and facilitate and if you're in the talent management planning space um, the what you do there to help people be uh, successful throughout the system I hope you'll stay in touch and you'll follow us. We're posting a variety of pieces as we continue to do this work and utilize this new intellectual property uh, that uh, we feel will help a new generation of folks who are being successful or want to be successful inside of enterprises. So thank you much. Uh, this webinar will be posted and be available on our website. Uh, before too long and you can share it with other people if you felt that it had value and I hope you do and that you'll participate in some of the other webinars that are listed on our webpage uh, with upcoming events. Take care, be healthy, be safe. Until next time.